Good day, welcome to another edition of Spotlight on Brewster Schools. Eric Gross, your host, along with Superintendent of Schools, Valerie Henning Piedmont. And Val, the weather is still all upside down. It is. It's been that way for the year, so at least it's <laughs> consistent, right? So now it's, uh, you know, a lot of rain and, you know, some teasers with some warm temperature and then it reverts back to, you know, something that, you know, keeps us, you know, makes you want to stay inside. So, but eventually, eventually we're going to have yes, great, yeah. hot weather before, you know it. before we know it. Snow days are gone. All, all snow days, up. all used up. Nothing else is left over. That okay. April, our April break from, uh, which was originally going to be, uh, Good Friday uh, through um, um, the week of April 2nd through right, the 6th right. uh, actually resulted in us uh, having to be in school on April 4th, 5th, and 6th. And um, unfortunately, you know, that no one wanted that to happen because some families did plan to use this time and they didn't use or their vacation times together didn't, um, didn't make the February time uh, available. Um, what I also want to mention, Eric, is that the Board of Regents in New York State uh, made a decision last week with regards to uh, the 180-day uh, uh, instructional or the 180 instructional days. Right. So uh, we our our uh, calendar development group, which includes the leadership from our BTA uh, as well as our AAB and central office administrators, will be looking at the calendar that we put forth to uh, uh, adopt um, some months ago, uh, but we had a disclaimer on that calendar that stated that we were waiting for a final decision from the New York State uh, Committee that was addressing this issue. issue. So actually we're meeting again this week uh, to look at any of those provisions to see if um, we need to make any adjustments. Um, the big change was related to how the hours are calculated. So for, if, uh, for children in grades K through six, for example, they're required to have 900 instructional hours for the school year. Mm. Um, and for students in grades 7 through 12, their requirement is 990. And the reason why that's so important is because it gives school districts, you know, New York State is huge. There's 700 sure. districts in the, in the state of New York. Some of them have uh, different uh, holidays or, you know, different, you know, based upon their communities. So giving them the flexibility to have hours rather than to say every week there's a certain number of instructional hours, you're able to kind of include, you know, other kinds of, of uh, community-based uh, um, uh, issues or, or needs that, that have to be calendared in. On an annual basis. On an yeah, annual basis, yeah. basis. Good. Okay. So more on the calendar. How many snowdays, by the way, built in for next year? Uh, we'll still have five built five. in, okay. but the difference is that we will, you know, we'll, we'll uh, uh, indicate uh, all the days that could be mm -hmm. lost due to uh, a bad, you know, very bad winter. Now, of course, one of the things that we that the calendar development uh, committee is looking at is whether we should go back to a full week full February break. Uh, as you recall, a few years ago we changed that right. because we had a, 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 a winter right. where we had been out for so often, That's for so right. long, I mean, been out every day, I mean, been out many days leading up to the February break, that when we arrived at the February break, everyone was sort of like, you know, very puzzled. Like, so we were out all these days, why do we now need a February break? Right. So that's why it was changed. Okay. So, but it looks like you know through a lot of you know kind of conversations and thinking and hearing from some of our families mm -hmm. that a February break is at least a guaranteed option that parents who do you know based upon their own jobs uh, can use that as a full week. So that's what the calendar development committee is looking at. Okay, super. Some other exciting news throughout the Brewster Schools, a lot of exciting news these days. Mario Guevara. Mario is a super, super young man, middle school young boy, came to this country only two years ago from his native land of Guatemala. And Mario has been a New York State champion in the Geography B. What a super kid. What an amazing success story. I mean, here's a young man who has only been in the country for two years and develop a love for geography by doing what? Reading the encyclopedia. encyclopedia. And his grandmother's house in Guatemala. Exactly. And, and through, all, through his own sort of determination and, and, and initiative, he learned a, a, an extraordinary amount about geography. And it, when I was speaking to his teacher uh, to ask him, you know, sort of what, what, what were some of the questions, the types of questions that a student would be expected sure. to answer in this kind of competition? 
they actually had to do a lot of critical thinking and you know and a lot of analysis of right. information. So it wasn't just a regurgitation no. of facts. Yeah. They had to pull together different information to come up with you know uh, answers to certain questions. So it really did show a deep knowledge and an ability to analyze and to infer and and that's what makes this an exceptional you know uh, story about a child's own drive and 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 you know and he was actually a point away I believe. Right. You know from. Winning. That's right. One question. One question away. One question away. And Mario is one of 100 from across the state of New York. Mario Guevara, congratulations. Congratulations, Mario. When it comes to geography, not many people know more than our friend Mario Guevara. Mario, a 13-year-old eighth grader here at the Wells Middle School, and Mario has just come back from Albany being named one of the top 100 students in a statewide national geography bee. Congratulations. Well, thank you. How did it all begin? Uh, well, it started back in my home country where I will go to my grandmother's house in the weekends and I will um, look at her old encyclopedia for just for fun, out of curiosity. And what did you find in the encyclopedia? Uh, well, I found like many countries and capitals, uh, etc. And I would like look at maps. And did you ever think you'd like to visit some of these places someday? Yeah. And then the geography bug bit you, as they say. And tell me about the contest. Well, I think it was okay. Um, there was only like eight questions, and you had to get um, all of eight, all the. Hmm, sorry. All eight questions. Yeah. Yeah. But I only got uh, seven out of eight, so I couldn't qualify to the next. Next level. Yeah, next level. Sorry. Yeah. John Clark, John, you know, when you think of this young man over here, in the United States, a little more than two years from his native Guatemala, and he's a state champion, one of 100 from the tens of thousands of students around the state. That's quite a recognition. Oh, absolutely. I mean, we're just very proud of Mario, and, and you know, like you said, he's only been here for a short time, um, but he comes with this wealth of knowledge, and... Um, you know, he knows so much more than I ever knew in terms of, you know, geography. I, you know, I have a difficult time finding my way around the map. And I've traveled quite a bit. So it's just truly impressive, you know, how well he does. And, you know, he's, he's apologized a couple times for, you know, not having the words, but he's only been speaking English for a few years. So it just shows how far he's come in so short a time and how far he's going to go. I, I wouldn't be surprised how many of these places he visits in his lifetime. Another handsome gentleman here this morning is Mike Bellucci. And Mike, of course, is a teacher in the Brewster School System 25 years. This is quite an honor for this young man, isn't it? For the Brewster School District. It's great for the district, for the for Mario here, and really the whole you know, school here at Wells. We, we love this competition, and everybody kind of gets on board. And Mario you know, brought it, brought it to fruition for us and competed up at the state and really did a great job for us here at, at Wells. What does the competition consist of, Mike? Well, it starts at the, at the grade level, and it starts really in the classroom. So Mario had to actually, you know, compete against everybody in, this, in school. Um, he got to our stage competition where he won the uh, school-wide B. And then he had to take a 70-question test online in 60 minutes. And that test score went to National Geographic in D.C. where they check them all, and Mario's score landed him in the top 100 in New York State, which then qualified him for the B up there in, in Albany. So, so he did a great job. It was you know, an amazing you know, journey for him. Okay. Yeah. What's the future for Mario? What are your plans? Once uh, you get out of uh, Henry Wells Middle School, it's off to Brewster High, then what? Um, uh, say college. Say college. What do you want to do? Do you want to major in? Do you want to major in history or geography? Uh, maybe. Maybe? Okay. Yeah. Well, again, congratulations. Oh, thank you. Pick out a place somewhere in the world. We want our friend of the here to figure it out right now. Okay. Um, see if you can find Brewster, New York. It's like about in here, north of New York City. Okay. All right. How about Madagascar? Um, in the, to the east of Africa. Okay. And how about the Arabian Sea? Here. Like... West of India. West of India. Excellent. Nice job. Our friend. Albany. Can we find <laughs> Albany, New York? Like 
here in the middle of New York. Very good. Okay. Mario, quite a future, not only in the Brewster schools, but in his future goals. Congratulations. Good job, Mario. Thank you. You know, we talk about the weather. We have a guarantee for you guys out there. Good weather this Sunday. Why? The American Heart Walk. 700 people minimum gather here on the Brewster School campus. Walk for the American Heart Association. Come on out. Have a ball. Registration at 9. The walk starts at 10. And what a great cause. And Bruce is glad to host it every year. Every every year, it's um, we have a lot of people who are interested in, um, you know, making sure that we raise awareness about a, you know the, the importance of a healthy heart. Do you know I was in a, a, a first grade yeah. physical education class, Mr. Gross, and these little first graders were learning about the importance of the heart, the size of the heart, the kind of activities that you have to engage in, you know, to get to make sure that your heart is active. Mm -hmm. uh, they knew how to, you know, how to to count, to, you know, to, to determine, you know, what their, you know, what level they should be, you know, uh, functioning at. These are first graders, wow. and this was in their phys ed class, and I want to thank Mrs. Hirschman, whose classroom I was visiting, uh, who actually was focusing on that. So it's a huge, huge event that, that, it, that impacts every child in, in, you know, in the district, and our physical education and health teachers absolutely spend a lot of time focusing on that. So once again, this Sunday, 9 o'clock registration, 10 o'clock the walk starts, come on now, it's going to be a nice day. Students also walked outside a couple of weeks ago or rallied for the, uh, the anti-gun violence situation. Brewster took part in this. It was a very, very lovely ceremony, 17 minutes, right to the point, and uh, got the message out there. They did. These were students who have been uh, all along. They didn't just jump on this bandwagon, <coughs> Eric. They were, these are, uh, student, these are uh, students who participate in our uh, Democratic uh, Congress, mm -hmm. which is our student government at the high school, uh, as well as other student leaders, some of whom are serve on uh, our Brewster community group, which we're going to talk about you know, shortly in terms of an event that, that was sponsored by that group. But they have been involved all along. They wanted to be, uh, to show their, you know, that their interest in what was happening in the community and, 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 and be involved in, you know, being a, a part of the solution, not just complaining, but being a part of the solution. Uh, and they are, they are the ones who uh, approached Mrs. Hoyler and asked her, you know, could we participate in this? What would we, what would we have to do? And in collaboration with Mrs. Hoyler, who also uh, obviously brought in myself and, 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 and other uh, uh, administrators, uh, made a decision that we couldn't say no to this, but we, off we wanted to make sure our Board of Education was aware. So we brought the students to a board meeting where uh, actually it happens to be that we had a number of parents available right. as well. And those students got to demonstrate what kind of leaders they were and why they were committed to this issue. Uh, and that they just, as I said, they just weren't, you know, kind of, you know, getting on the, the bandwagon, but that, that, that they had a deep commitment to, uh, to making sure that they did whatever they could to prevent the next school shooting. Okay, so we were there that day for the rally. Let's go back and take a look, see. Friends. 
has described him as inspiring and as someone who obviously had a bright future ahead of him. He was part of his school's marching band and spent his short 14 year life doing what he loved most, playing music and bringing others joy with his musical talent. In these moments we honor Alex, another child whose life was stopped short, another child whose dreams will never be fulfilled. Enough is enough. Um, I will be speaking about Alyssa Alhadef. Alyssa Alhadef was one of the 17 people tragically killed at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida. Alyssa was a very, very talented soccer player and she played for her high school team as well as Parkland Travel Soccer. She was a leader, she was smart, and she was truly loved by her friends and family. We can't let Alyssa become just another name on a list. We can't let her become another statistic. Life is precious. That is why we must make change happen, and everyone attending this walk out today is on the way, on the right path. Alyssa, you are loved and will be missed. Enough is enough. Jamie Gutenberg was another victim of Florida shooting. Jamie was a dancer, and as a dancer, I know how much dance means to another dancer. She is described as the sweetest, most amazing girl, and she always had a smile on her face and brightened any room she walked into. The American Ballet Theater and many other dance companies wore orange ribbons on their costumes to honor Jamie in this time of tragedy. Jamie wanted to be a pediatric physical therapist and work with children who had limb deformities. Her father said Jamie, wherever she went, she was the energy in the room. He also said that she was always vocal and passionate and she was always heard. I hope Jamie is watching over us today knowing we are her voice now that hers was taken away too soon. Enough is enough. To know Scott Beagle was to know an amazing human being. Not only was he a geography teacher at Stoneman Douglas High School and an instructor at Camp Starlight, but he was a hero and an inspiration to many who knew him. I spoke to a friend of mine from my sleepaway camp, who was a survivor of the shooting, about Scott. Although she didn't have him as a teacher, she said that in school, he was the nicest teacher to everyone, especially for it only being his first year teaching here. Another girl who happened to actually go to the camp that he worked at said this, and I think that this says it all. She said, I honestly can't think of any words to describe Scott. He was a person that you didn't need to have as a division leader, and he would still give you the opportunity to get to know him as if you had forever. Each and every person was touched by Scott in some way. His humor and sarcasm were amazing to be around. All I could say to you is that you just had to know him to know how incredible he was, but I could go on forever. Scott Beagle will live on in the people's lives that he touched. Enough is enough. Helena Ramsey was 17 years old. She was a junior in high school. She was born in Portsmouth, England on January 19, 19 2001. Helena moved with her family to Coral Springs at the age of two. Helena cared about human rights and the environment. She also served on, the, on a United Nations club and in the Christian faith-based first priority group. She took care of two stray cats that she took in, who were named Yoshi and Kayoko. They would go on to have many kittens with the Ramseys, caring for up to 13 cats at one point. Helena had a great sense of humor. She would, go, she would be tweeting during her study halls, making other students laugh. Teachers would also have funny conversations, laughing and crying, talking to Helena. A lot of Helena's close friends would always go to her when she was really stressed. Helena would always calm down her friends when they thought they were going to fail a test. Helena always had a positive attitude and never was selfish, just like her last final moments. Enough is enough. Meadow Pollock, a senior at Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School in Parkland, Florida, was named among the 17 people killed by a school shooter on Wednesday. Meadow, a senior, planned to attend Lynn University in the fall. On that Monday, she shared a photo on Facebook of her and her grandmother, Evelyn Silverberg Pollock. Nothing makes me happier than my grandma and her smile she wrote. An aunt stated that Meadow was the light of our life. She was beautiful. We all loved her. She had a big family that loved her, she said. Her father, Andrew Pollock, spent hours outside Broward Health North Hospital, where many of the victims were sent, hoping to hear from his daughter. He kept calling her phone over and over, hoping to hear her voice. On Thursday morning, he announced that Meadow had died. Enough is enough. Martin Dukek Anguiano was 14 years old when his life was taken away. Marna was a freshman at Stoneman Douglas High School. Marna is described as being a very fun-loving, extroverted young man, who, according to his family, was often quite quiet. Marna enjoyed Star Wars, soccer, and he reg regularly attended church. He was proud to be a member of Major League Stoneman Douglas High School, JROTC program. He was a thoughtful student and a well-liked cadet. Marna's JROTC awards include the Medal of Heroism, Perfect Attendance Ribbon, Leadership Development Ribbon, JROTC Athletic Ribbon, 
good conduct ribbon, personal appearance ribbon, parade ribbon. I hope that Martin is watching over us today. Enough is enough. Elena Petty was a high school student, an Army JROTC cadet, a daughter, and a friend. She loved to help people and make people happy, so it was no surprise that she was involved in numerous fundraisers to assist the victims of the hurricane in Puerto Rico, as well as other community service projects. It did, however, surprise her parents that she wanted to join the Army JROTC unit until they found out why. She wanted to use ROTC as a way to honor her brother Patrick, who was in the service, and also as a way to honor her country. Because of her dedication and love for those around her, she was awarded the JROTC Medal of Heroism. I stand here to honor and remember all that she has done for her family, her friends, her community, and for our country. Enough is enough. His name was Christopher Hickson. He was 49 years old, just 11 days away from his 50th birthday. He is leaving behind a loving wife, Deborah, two sons, Thomas and Corey, and daughters, Jessica and Jennifer. He was a veteran. He joined the Navy in 1986 and transitioned into the Naval Reserves in 1992, where he retired in October of 2013. Autumn, 17 young people today. High School National Brewster High School took part in this national movement because we are not ready to sit complacently like waiting sheep for this, for our school to become part of the statistics. We're standing up because unlike our politicians that are funded by the National Rifle Association, we have no ulterior motives in trying to generate change. This issue affects us directly. Fear has no place in our schools and we shouldn't have to come to school and sit here and mentally construct blueprints in our head every single day of the exit points in our school and where we can hide. Sorry. Very passionate about this, aren't you? Yes, we all are. And together we're generating the change that we want to see. We're following in the footsteps of the direct victims of Parkland, of Columbine, of Las Vegas, of every single mass shooting that never should have happened. Superintendent Valerie Henning Piedmont, Dr. Henning Piedmont. Easy spoiler. Want to come on down for one second? I know when these end. Uh, Nikki Hall, the principal here at Bruce High. A very emotional morning here at Bruce High School. But as the superintendent said at the end, bravo. These young people are standing up. Absolutely. It's been an emotional uh, month, actually. You know, it's taken a month of the students um, getting ready to, to voice their opinions and, and do something very concrete that could benefit the whole country. Superintendent Henry? Well, it's a, to me, it's a proud moment in Brewster because our students spend um, their whole careers as, as students learning about American history and government. And this is what we would expect them to do is to be civically engaged and to, to do something that helps society and that helps everyone. It, this, this, this action, you know, could, uh, I hope, helps to advance um, our, 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 an awareness that we need to change the way in which we approach, um, you know, uh, who gets uh, access to a weapon, you know, our mental health uh, assistance for school districts um, that are not wore out by the taxpayer, but that we should get that assistance to be able to make sure that we have, you know, lots of resources to help young people and uh, and to be safe. And we all have it's a basic human right to be safe. And I appreciate the efforts of these children to to advance that cause. And there's more to the program than this demonstration outside the school. Daily activities are taking place at Brewster High today. Yeah, after, after this walkout, uh, they'll all go to our ILC. And uh, if they've signed up to be a part of the conversation about student activism, then they'll have uh, some speakers, some essays on it, and some small group conversations about what they can do from here on out. And another event takes place on the 24th that we know the Brewster School's endorsing as well. Well, we, we are hoping that some of our families will uh, take part in an activity of, of going to Washington, D.C. This is you know, something that's being organized by uh, students and groups uh, across Putnam County. So it isn't specific to Brewster, but certainly we hope that you know, some of our students and our families uh, will see that as also an opportunity to go and, and, and give voice to this cause. And my young friend over here? If I may, there's also a sister march taking place in White Plains. If you look up Westchester County March for Our Lives, you can see the information about it. Two students from Brewster High School, myself included, will be speaking. Okay. Thank you. Well, we thank you for this very uh, 
emotional morning. Oh, we thank the students. The ones who were students. We thank you very much and uh, keep up the good work. Thank you. And the cafeteria at the Henry Wells Middle School never smelled so good. The night when 1,000 pounds of meatballs and pasta and salad and bread all put together to benefit the Cove Care Center. It's one of my favorite events of the school year, sponsored by H.H. Wells, uh, under the leadership of Miss Jean Marie Mullen, who's yes. a phenomenal math teacher and, and human being, uh, and, and other really fabulous uh, uh, people at H.H. Wells who make this possible every year. This is all the staff. All the staff, whether they're you know you know slicing bread oh. or they are serving uh, pasta and meatballs and sauce or or getting the the cold drinks ready or who are preparing the, the dessert uh, room and it's a dessert room, That's not right. a dessert table, a room, <laughs> um, and just in cleaning tables. Like yeah. it's such a, an amazing you know community experience uh, for H H Wells and what a marvelous opportunity to raise funds for Cove Care but also to, to raise funds to, uh, to, uh, for children who are going on the uh, Washington, D.C. trip, which is a, 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 a legacy trip that the eighth graders go on every year. But for those students who, who can't afford all, you know, to, to go, part of the proceeds from this benefit uh, pays for their, their participation. And they had 400 people there that night, two separate seatings. We were there as well. Let's go back and check it out. The big night has come. The seventh annual Henry Wells Middle School Pasta Night. Jean Marie Mullen organized this many years ago. Jean Marie, bigger crowd than ever before. Yes, we're expecting uh, almost 400 people here this evening, and it is just a wonderful community event. We have families coming out, children coming out. Uh, we have a Pops concert afterwards, so it's just a whole great evening here. And it goes for a wonderful cause. It does. We uh, donate all of our proceeds from the dinner to Cove Care, which is a local organization here in town, and they help all of our youth in Putnam. And it's just, they are a wonderful group and very deserving. And of course, Cove Care was the former Putnam County Family and Community Services. Yes, it was. They just changed their name, and it looks wonderful. And again, the, the, the volunteers here tonight. We have teachers like our friend Marshall Littman cutting bread. How many loaves of bread have you cut? Oh, I don't know. Too many to count, but it's for a good cause. <laughs> All for a good cause. How many meatballs and pounds of pasta? We have 100 pounds of pasta. I have 38 teachers that baked brownies last night. I don't even know how many meatballs they have about, I'd say about maybe a thousand meatballs are ready to go. So we're, we're ready. And again, all this for a great cause. The seven, tell our viewers about the history behind this, about the Barbara Gillette Memorial yes, Scholarship. This, this uh, evening started with the bar, when Barbara Gillette, a teacher here, passed away. And we have a scholarship fund in her name for uh, eighth graders, two eighth graders. And then after that scholarship fund was established, we all felt like it was a great community night and wanted to keep it going. So we're just keeping it going. We'll be going forever and ever, we hope. I hope so. Well, the seventh annual Pasta Night, a great success here in the Brewster Schools. Well, when it comes to education, <laughs> Superintendent Valerie Henning Piedmont does it all, even serves the bread. I baked this bread, Eric. You what are you talking bread? about? <laughs> Anything for the Spaghetti Bistro here at H.H. Uh, Wells Middle School. What a great night. 400 people, the money raised for Cove Care. Couldn't ask for anything better. It is. They're just an awfully generous, kind, you know, thoughtful group of educators and staff in this building who care deeply about the community. And this event, which, you know, you, uh, you've already spoken to uh, Jean Marie Mullen, who's been the architect of, of organizing it, and, and along with the other wonderful staff members at, at here at Wells. So it, 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 it's can only be a success, Eric, and I'm glad to be the bread server. And when you think a thousand meatballs, a hundred pounds of pasta, it's great, and it's good food. It's great food, and the families are here. Uh, you know, everybody comes, they enjoy it. There are two, uh, I think there are two uh, city seatings, uh, the 531, so I'm here for this, and I, I love it. I love coming here. It's one of my favorite events of the year. Well, have a good time at all. Thank you. Bon appétit. Bon appétit. Thank you. A couple of weekend events took place recently. We're talking about the Mathathon at the high school. Children, the third graders from the CV Star Intermediate School are taught by the high school students, the Mu Alpha Theta Honor Society. Again, the interaction, the love for math, 
fantastic. It's an awesome way for uh, older children to mentor younger children. So uh, under the leadership of uh, Mrs. Hollick, De uh, Deirdre Hollick, who's an amazing uh, math educator at the high school, uh, these groups of students are working with some of our other, our students, our younger students at CV Star. Uh, you can see the signs all over the building uh, leading up to this. And this was a phenomenal way for them to uh, be involved in mentoring uh, this sort of next generation of Mu Alpha Theta uh, uh, students. Uh, but at the same time, uh, raise funds for a very important cause, which was uh, uh, monies for St. Jude's. St. Jude's, $2,000 raised That's this year, great. Which is really wonderful. It's, it is phenomenal. Congratulations, one and all. And Bruce's World Cup of Community, C-O-M-M, -M, capital U-N-I-T-Y, was held on a Friday night at the Brewster High School. Hundreds of people came on. Amazing, the different cultures, the different countries, the games the activities bringing Brewster to one. It was an, an, an amazing um, sort of culminating experience. I mean, this group of people who've been working behind the scenes, uh, now calling themselves Brewster Community, they, they met as a result of uh, an unfortunate uh, video that, uh, date, you know, that appeared last July. Right. Um, and that, you know, the objective of that group coming together was to uh, pre you know, present another image of, of our community, uh, not one that you know uh, that that was that may have been uh, concluded from that particular situation. But this group has met numerous times, and this was one of the events that was planned as a way to bring our families together just for fun, for games, to learn about new games from other played in other countries like Argentina and mm -hmm. Ireland and Nicaragua. you know Guatemala, right. or Nicar Nicaragua, um, and and for you know for uh, us to go upstairs. After the you know after the uh, world the the games were played and you know people had an opportunity to eat some delicious food that was catered by Miss Kathy Ash our, uh, our director of our uh, child nutrition program um, all the funds all everything all the monies for the food for the prizes for the decorations were all um, sponsored they were donations or through sponsorships and the Irish dance was phenomenal yeah. and upstairs and that and that and Mrs uh, Carrie Oster one of our our wonderful speech uh, and language teachers right. at CB Star um, actually uh, donated the services of, of those wonderful dancers and uh, who actually perform uh, Irish step dance and actually performed the first time that I've seen Eric a group lesson so <laughs> many students from the audience and adults came up to the stage yeah. to learn various steps it was a, it was just outstanding uh, and then before that just to rewind we had a group uh, trivia uh, contest uh, through Kahoot, Ms. Donna Schneider and the students from uh, the HH Wells Student Government and Leadership Group and along with Mr. Clark and Mrs. Zimbraski um, worked together to pull that off and it was cr incredible. Audience members participated, they answered questions, the students developed the questions that are based upon um, facts from different countries. Mm. So that whole theme of learning about different cultures and and you know uh, and uh, you know having some uh, healthy com uh, competition was really on um, on on display that night. Bruce does it right, Val. They, Brewster does it right, and our our families come out, and it was just amazing and an incredible experience and something to remember. Let's go check out the community get together here at Brewster High. It's called the World's Cup of Cultures. We're here at Brewster High School on a Friday evening. Hundreds of people in the cafeteria. Superintendent Valerie Henning Piedmont Val, what a turnout for such a great organizational group. It is, and these are all volunteers. These are all parents and students and a few administrators who decided to do something to enhance and make the community you know, better and come together. And this is the first event, which is, you know, as you can see, is pretty successful. So everything that's here, people donated. Uh, Corey and Tiffany have been the organizers and, uh, of the group, kept us or, you know, doing what we were supposed to do and moving ahead. So it's really exciting to see this happen. Tiffany, yes. how did it all begin? Um, we're just a group of parents who decided to, you know, with the invitation of Valerie and the district, to get together and, and work towards making a change. And, and our goal is to expose everyone to different cultures and, and that kind of positive stuff, just all positive. <laughs> Corey, positive with a capital P, huh? Yeah, ca positive with a capital P. I mean, all credit due to Tiffany. She put in a lot of work with this, a lot of hard work, just to kind of uh, expose the community to different cultures. So very proud of all the hard work Tiffany did. And we have a variety of here. South America, Central America, Eastern Europe, you name it. Yes, we do. I think we have 
13 countries and we doubled up two or three times. So I think we have 16 tables total. Great turnout. And Valerie, you know, the kids are so into this. The high school students, the middle school students, children at the elementary level. They are. Even our face painters are Brewster High School students. Two ninth graders who volunteer their time and they're outside, you know, uh, manning the face uh, painting table. So it's, this is really a, a, a group effort. Even the decorating, you know, everything, the setting up and organizing, it truly is what we thought it would be. And this is the first of many. It really is. And this group has more work to do, so this is a really good way to start. We're going to check out some of the booths and say hi to some of the people. You stay tuned. Well, whenever there's an event in the Brewster Schools, Robin Green is here, of course, very involved with the Parents Association, the Sports Association. And Robin, you've donned your German outfit tonight, and you're playing coffer packing. What is that all about? That's, we're going to Grandma's house, and we're packing a coffer, which is a suitcase. So it's a memory game that you can play when you're on the road with kids. And it comes from Germany. And uh, so I'm teaching the kids a little bit about it, and the kids are doing very well. And what is your name? Tatiana. Tatiana, you are? Solomon Tato. So as you can see, some of the young people are having a ball here playing coffer packing at the festival. Well, Madeline and Madison are here at the booth that says Argentina and Cuba. Ladies, tell us what you're doing. So we are playing um, one of the games. It's a string game, and it's super fun. It's from Cuba, and it's what my grandmother used to play when she was a little girl. Do you like playing the game? Yes. What is your name? Aurelia. And how old are you? Six. Six. What, what game are you playing there? The string game. What game is she playing? Uh, the string game. The string game. And what's the, will you just put that together and make different patterns? Is that yeah. it? Yeah. It's always going to have an X or two lines. And then you just keep on going until like it falls apart. So as you can see, there are many, many, many activities taking place, as we said earlier in this little segment, from Central and South America, from Eastern Europe, from the United States, from all over the world. The great festival, the cultural festival in Brewster, here at Brewster High, a great success. Thanks so much. Another great annual event that took place in the last couple of weeks was the Colonial Fair. And of course, everything dates back to the colonial era, People get dressed up in their colonial garb. Good learning lesson for the children. And it's a very memorable one. Yeah, I mean, yeah. it, uh, it you know, having participated or gone over to see it, you know, every year, uh, it is an incredible opportunity for children to uh, have an authentic experience. You know, that's set in the in the colonial era. So all of the educators dress up, the students. We have uh, others who come in and actually do stenciling and in quilting. Uh, uh, um, apple cider making, candle making, all of those kinds of things are colonial games. Uh, it's really an incredible experience that helps children to uh, uh, be connected beyond what they read, yes. to see and you know uh, as best as they can through a simulation, you know what it was like to live during that era. So it's it's extremely exciting, and uh, the students I think enjoy it. I think it's one of the things that they remember from their 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 experience at CD Star. And this year's fair, by the way, was highlighted by a special guest, Amy Campanero, who is the executive director of the Southeast Museum. Stop by. She presented a program called Southeast in Colonial Times. So the kids actually saw firsthand through pictures and games how things were in the 1700s. Exactly, yeah. and there's a lot of amazing history here in Putnam yeah, County yeah. Um, that um, you know I think this encourages children to learn more about those and to go to those places. Okay, congratulations, one and all, Matt. Well, Matt Scipione, Putnam County's newest Eagle Scout. You came up on that weekend, and of course you were there for the ceremony. Uh, what a what a handsome young man. Uh, Absolutely, and Matt is such a wonderful, you know, talented young yep. man and a great leader. Um, I know he wants to be uh, become a teacher. Uh, I think he's, uh, you know, he has a lot of. Uh, he's done so much, and, and this was a an event that it really highlighted all that he's done. Oh, sure. You know, to to get to that point of uh, uh, becoming an Eagle Scout. Um, he uh, is also part of my superintendent's advisory group, uh, where he is, you know, his uh, his sense of humor yep. is always on dis on display.
display, and he's just a great young man. And this couldn't be, you know, this this award or this designation uh, couldn't have happened to a, a finer young person. And as Val says, uh, Matt plans to study adolescent education in biology and chemistry, and he intends to teach the next generation of young people. Maybe you're Heron Brewster. And I can see him doing it. Yeah. I mean, he has the enthusiasm. He has the the, the sense of humor and the connection and, you know, kind of the, the drive, I mean, and, and the love, you know, of, of, of being able to show others, you know, and, 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 and inspire others. Yes, very good, Matt. Congratulations, old boy. Congratulations, Matt. Well, Rich Parenti is the proprietor of the Clock Tower Grill in Brewster, teams up with the Brewster schools every year. No, not to give them food or anything. He actually buys skateboards and children in my friend... Danielle Michelini's class, used to be Danielle Scalera, yeah, I know. <laughs> Michelini's class puts these skateboards together, paints them, they had a little reception the other night, it was a lot of fun. It's a great event and I applaud uh, Mrs. Um, uh, Michelini for continuing to be interested in, in making this available for students. It takes a lot of time oh, with these kinds of projects. Doing it. Exactly, yeah, yeah. lots of time and students are very enthusiastic because again, it gives them a chance to uh, you know, apply their skills mm -hmm. to create something that has some value, some social value, and 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 they they learn about why they're doing this, and uh, I think it and, it and they contribute to the development of a product that that's sold. And the um, the design of the skateboards are inspired by famous artists. Exactly, it's not just, it's it's not just random. So no, they get to no. learn about yeah. an artist and emulate that yes. artist's style. And, and, you know, create this on a skateboard. Yeah. How cool is that? Really cool. Let's check out the cool skateboards. She's smiling. We're talking about our friend Danielle Michelini, the art teacher at the CV Star School. We're here at a great restaurant in Brewster, Clock Tower Grill, for the annual, the fifth annual, skateboard exhibition. What a wonderful night. It's been a great collaboration. Um, Rich had originally approached me five years ago and said, you know, what do you think? And we tried it and it was so successful, we just keep coming back. And the children actually designed their own skateboards, skateboards provided by the Parentes. Yes, they buy them and um, we start in the fall. Um, the students choose an artist uh, from history that they would like to research. They create a composition of a few pieces by that artist in their own, you know, configuration, and they've been painting since October. And they're so colorful. They are. They are. They're very colorful. Um, it's a great opportunity because we paint in class, you know, but this, they really get to go in depth and... The composition is kind of this weird shape, right? They're not used to anything but this rectangle normally. So that's a little bit of a challenge and it's interesting. And they are mixing colors and learning about color theory, but also, you know, how they can create a masterpiece. You do wonderful things in the classroom anyway. Many, many wonderful things. Visits upstate, contests, competitions. The fourth graders and fifth graders at CB Star really excel. Thank you. Yes, our fifth graders are preparing for their trip to Saratoga. They're first without me, um, but everything is packed up and ready to get on the bus in just under two weeks. So hopefully you'll be hearing back from us, maybe not an interview with me, but uh, more success up there as well. well we wish Danielle <laughs> the very best over here. Boy or girl? It's a girl, and she's set to arrive in five or six days, so. Again, congratulations. <laughs> Thank you. I wish you the best. Thank you. Another great night, the skateboard exhibition here at Clock Tower Grill. <laughs> well, two of the young ladies who have designed their skateboards are Ava and Bianca. Ladies, good evening. How are you tonight? Good. Are you excited about the skateboards? Yeah. What's your skateboard design after? Hen Henry... Madison, I think it is. Okay. Yeah. And what colors was your skateboard? A whole bunch of colors. A whole bunch of colors. What about you, Bianca? Um, my skateboard. Um, my artist is Salvador Dali, and I have I have like um, sky blue, teal. Not really teal, more like yeah, I guess, and green. Was it fun painting the skateboards? Very fun. How come? I don't know, it was just very, we were active, it was, it was nice to be in creative art. And you're going to use the skateboards on the street or you're just going to display them? 
I'm probably just gonna just play. What about you? I'm probably gonna ride it on the streets. Okay, right. How's your finger? It's good. Remember this young lady? We talked to this young lady, if you remember, back in whose class was that? Our friend? Mr. Lamort. That's right, Frank Lamort's class when they had Kane's Arcade. And she had a little problem with her pinky. How's that pinky coming along? It's good. All better. Yeah, I can move it. And okay, glad to hear it. <laughs> yeah. Well, have a good night. You too. Two of the special youngsters here at the restaurant. Well, it's that time of the year again. May 15th is budget vote time. The Board of Education is in its final stages now, wrapping up the budget. Um, how do things shape up? Well, um, a few districts uh, are obviously uh, struggling in terms of uh, the, the, the gap between uh, what the state has provided from, you know, in terms of aid, and 20%, as you know, of right. our uh, budget comes from uh, state aid. Uh, this year, we only received about $235,000 above what we received last year. But at the same time, uh, we have increases in health care costs as well as uh, contributions to our uh, to the teacher's retirement system, which increased almost about uh, uh, over 8%. Uh, on top of that, we have a tax cap yeah. that we are honored and bound to, to, to make sure we, we follow. And with that, Eric, unfortunately, at the very beginning, you know, we had almost a $3 million deficit until we started looking very closely at all of our, all of our budget codes. So every, you know, every uh, uh, administrator in the district, which all the schools and all the directors looked at their budgets, and those were trimmed to, to you know, uh, as far down as we could go. Um, and after trimming, uh, Eric, we, or we looked at a, the first set of retirements that we had and we determined in, in our conversation with the, with the director or the principal that was affected uh, whether they could live without those positions and so that netted us some additional uh, revenue uh, as a result of not replacing those people. Uh, and even with that, Eric, we still were uh, found ourselves needing um, having a $656,000 gap. Mm. So with all those 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 moves, we yeah. still um, uh, found ourselves needing to look much more fur much further into the into um, some additional retirements and additional resignations. So uh, we had the very un unpleasant uh, task on uh, April 10th to look at those remaining positions and make uh, uh, very difficult uh, decisions with regards to which one of, which ones of those that we would not be able to replace, because that was the only source of revenue left. I wouldn't even call it revenue. The only place that we could yeah, look yeah. to restore funds to our general budget. Um, and uh, those were presented to the Board of Education. Um, it, and all of those will have an impact. You know, they will uh, increase class sizes. Uh, for example, one of the places where we, you know, um, we made a reduction, um, uh, obviously at the high school, we um, um, had three administrators there. Those three administrators will be there in the fall. So mm -hmm. in, instead of replacing the vacant AP position, uh, we left, we took that one off the table because we do have three okay. administrators there. Uh, there were some other challenges associated with um, making sure that we were also able to have an SPO uh, at CD Star, so we didn't want to take that off the table. And that's actually one of the uh, the least expensive um, uh, positions because uh, we don't play, pay any of the benefits. Uh, the people who assume an SPO position are retired probation or police officers, so we only pay the thirty-seven thousand for their salary. So the three SROs and one SPO. Right, and then we're working with our um, our. Um, uh, uh, sergeant who's in charge of the S Mike uh, ROs, Mike Zabo, right. to identify that SPO. The, it's been a long-standing um, criticism at um, uh, between CD Star and HH Wells because, uh, as wonderful as Deputy Nooner is, right. he can't you know he two can't cover places. two buildings. Right. And uh, we've done that for as long as I think we can. Probably you know did it a lot longer than we we could have. Okay. But this recent set of unfortunate. Uh, school shootings, the one in Parkland, really made it clear that we couldn't, you know, we couldn't afford to move forward on not having an SPO at 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 CD Star. An SPO, you know, obviously, again, the difference is that they're retired. Right. Uh, they still carry a weapon. Right. They don't have a car. Right. They go through the same training that an SRO goes through, right. and they're, ex you know, they are expected to 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 function, you know, the the, the you know, uh, to the best of their ability uh, um, uh, in those in those roles. And of course, the SPO would be supported by by Mike Nooner because they are, in the, you know, covering some of the same ground. So that's one of the positions we we didn't feel that we could say no to again. Well, there might be some good news coming down the line, the Putnam legislature at a meeting recently has petitioned the state of New York 
to pay for mm -hmm. an SPO or an SRO mm -hmm. in every school mm -hmm. in the statewide movement exactly. in New York State, right. that would be a tremendous savings. That would be an extraordinary saving, savings. And the Westchester Putnam School Boards Association, right. as well as the Lower Hudson Council School Superintendents, are also advocating strongly right. for that. That because in, in essence, it's it's you know we know it in this day and age we have to have you know an SPO and SRO. We can no longer get away with not having that right. in, in our in our school. So if it's going to happen, then it should not be one of those, you know, unfunded mandates right. that we should have some funding that comes along with that. Um, so we had a very tough uh, budget you know, presentation meeting on April 10th. Uh, that was a discussion along with another discussion having to do with uh, a, uh, uh, a resolution that uh, in, it was inadvertently left off of uh, the public section of board docs uh, right. back in July of, uh, 11th of 2017. Right. Uh, and that uh, particular issue, unfortunately, Eric, had to go on uh, the agenda uh, with the, board, the budget presentation. You might ask, well, why couldn't you wait or why, why did you want to do that? Um, our uh, uh, Board of Education consulted with legal counsel and felt once it was brought to our attention Have that that ahead. item was, was, in, was, was that particular piece, of, uh, that uh, particular um, resolution which had to do with increasing the five um, uh, buyback days in the contracts in my contract as superintendent, the two assistant superintendents and the, the director. And that was done because, uh, as you recall, this last summer there was a tremendous amount of uh, construction activity yes. associated with a $38.9 million bond. Um, myself, I've already lost vacation time that I'll never recover because I was, I've was i been here, uh, but I did ask the Board of Education, could they consider that for us moving forward? Because we did need, we were definitely going to need to be uh, in the district for as much as we can rather than to, to, to take vacation. So unfortunately, that was the resolution that didn't get into the public section. It was available for the Board to review when the Board voted on it, so they were able to do their due diligence when they voted seven to zero to approve not only the raises that they had voted on but also the um, the additional five vacation buyback days and these are not five days above what was already available in terms of vacation the same the vacation was the same but the ability to use days that could potentially be lost that's what they approved. So unfortunately, that went on the, the April 10th um, agenda at the direction or the suggestion and recommendation of the legal counsel, so that again, that didn't uh, appear to be a way to cover up anything. It wasn't anything, anything sinister. There was nothing sinister. There were no under the table deals. There was no unauthorized you know, uh, 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 approval of anything. Yeah. The board had approved these. They had approved the increase in the raises. They had approved the uh, additional five uh, vacation buy buyback days, which is pretty standard and superintendents uh, uh, contracts across the state of New York as well as for assistant superintendents and directors so this is not uncommon practice mm -hmm. um, but unfortunately as I said it, it, it the appearance was terrible because it did you know here we are presenting uh, reductions Eric right so you can only imagine that the public must have thought we had lost our minds right. you know we, we're presenting we're presenting reductions but at the same time under the advice of legal counsel, it was a view to be critical to put that other item, the clarifying, yeah. clarifying resolution forward so that there was no appearance of trying to do something underhanded or to, you know, cover it up from the public. Okay. And so that's what created the, you know, the, the uh, various reports that, that uh, have appeared, this appearance again that somehow uh, I as a superintendent or the board did something unauthorized and, and that just isn't true. Okay. The informational budget hearing, by the way, is May 5th, May 5th, jot it down if you like more information. Budget brochures will be sent out. Absolutely. And we'll be doing a special budget show in the next week or so as well with Victor Carlson and Val, so you can get more of the nuts and bolts of the budget. And the important thing is to get out and vote on the 15th. That's important as well as uh, taking advantage of any opportunities, you know, in the event of uh, um, any community member or, or, or resident or uh, our employee of the district uh, uh, wasn't able to attend that board meeting. Uh, we're having a number of meetings after uh, uh, the end, at the end of the workday. Uh, we're having some meetings in the community to make sure, and in the school district to give everyone an opportunity to come out to hear, you know, what's in the budget and what and why decisions were made and why we had to put forth those. 13 uh, vacancies uh, uh, that were due to retirements or uh, resignations um, and to learn as much as they want you know as, as possible um, we also are going to explain 
asking, because uh, uh, we've gotten this question from uh, a number of residents, um, what if uh, the, the, the budget is voted down? So we're going to talk about you know the implications of that because that only makes matters worse. worse it doesn't yeah. make it better. Yeah. It may it may look like a way to protest, but it actually hurts the hurts, uh, hurts, hurts the children more yeah. because some other programs are affected, such as transportation, um, co-curricular, athletic programs. So it is it's no small thing when that happens. So we hope that if anyone has any questions about the budget, please come to one of these informational sessions to learn as much as you can, to ask questions. I will be there along with Mr. Victor Carlson, who's the Assistant Superintendent for Finance and Operations, to answer all those questions uh, and to provide you know, as much detail as we possibly can. But we, uh, it, it, uh, it is not, um, uh, it doesn't advantage uh, the taxpayer and it doesn't advantage children if we if a bu if a budget vote um, does not you know, go through if, if if it's voted down. So we okay. hope that doesn't happen. Informational budget hearing one more time May fifth. The budget vote May fifteenth. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you so much for joining us for this edition of Spotlight on Brewster Schools. Frankie, thank you for your able assistance. Until next time, the Superintendent Valerie Henning Piedmont. I'm Eric Gross. Bye bye now. Thank you.